Welcome to the Baker Street Irregulars Investigative Welcome to Recap. Welcome Sci-Fi Friday, you enjoy a podcast for science fiction film reality meets reality. I'm Jen Gibbs with Utah Education Network, and today we're stuff. discussing collaboration, computer coding, and classic Sherlock Holmes films with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. I've got a full studio here today. My guests are Carolyn Strutka, Jessica Liptak, and Kimberly Smith who are graduate students in atmospheric science at the University of Utah. Jessica, welcome to UEN Sci-Fi Friday. Hi, thanks for having me. And Kimberly, welcome. Thank you. And Carolyn, welcome back. So let's start by talking about um, Dress to Kill. Um, it starts with there's three music boxes that are sold at auction to three different buyers. Now there's something special about these music boxes. Um, Kimberly, what is it? So each music box plays the same song, but code. We have another Sherlock Holmes movie, though, that you watch that has coding in it, too. Um, Jessica, do you want to talk about that one? Uh, yes. Uh, the movie involves uh, basically the search for a nuclear physicist who's kidnapped in World War II, and he is spearheading a project that involves building a missile. And he also has fellow scientists working on this project. Um, to keep it top secret, he's uh, conveyed a message with how to construct each part of the missile, but done it in code that involves what's called or referred to, I believe, as the dancing men. So they look like little stick figures in different positions. And each position or stick figure position stands for a letter of the alphabet. So the issue is that the scientist is kidnapped by <laughs> uh, Sherlock Holmes' uh, uh, arch nemesis, Professor Moriarty. I like how the bad guy's a professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as us fans of higher ed, we yes. like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he's holding him and asking him, where are the rest of the plans to this missile? And, you know, he, uh, the scientists won't tell him. So professor's going out and slow but sure uh, nailing down the scientists and the pieces of code with the instructions for the various uh, missile components on them, the dancing men. So he's working on trying to craft these codes. Sherlock has one piece of the code as well to the final component of the missile. So he's working on this with Dr. Watson and trying to crack it. So yeah, they're, they're going back and forth and filling in letters. And I guess the, one of the key features is that they used to help them is they remember that E is the most common letter in the alphabet. So they kind of start from there and go on and assign letters to the dancing men. So in that case, like frequency is kind of used to help break the code. Mm -hmm. And we'll get back to this in, in a second. I'm just going to insert a little piece of trivia. So the, the film that you're discussing, The Secret Weapon, is actually based on an original Arthur Conan Doyle story called The Dancing Men. However, it was completely revised. I mean, the only thing the two have in common is the dancing men mm -hmm. as the device, the plot device here. It's, uh, it was completely updated for the times, you know, mm -hmm. with the Nazi plot and everything, which did not exist when Conan Doyle wrote his, his stories. Um, but back to the, to the issue of code, and now one of the reasons why I thought it would be fun to talk with you ladies about this set of movies is that you do code right? I mean, mm -hmm. code is a big part of your work. So we'll come back to the movies, but I'd love to stop for a minute and talk about your work, what you do, and, and how coding fits into it. Carolyn, what do you do in atmospheric science? Well, for my, um, for my master's thesis, I worked on a, a developing a code to run a model that traced the transport of carbon dioxide around the valley. And so what I do is you first find what your basic inputs are and then you solve some equations and a computer can help me solve those equations way faster than I ever could and at a much higher and rapid rate. And then what you can do, which is really fat, fascinating and quite fantastic, is you can image it and you can watch how the CO2 moves around the valley. And so I do spend a lot of time writing code, but I also spend a lot of time writing code to image what my, what my study area looks like. And that's important to kind of fits back in with the movies because we talk about dancing men or music boxes. They all are different forms of art. And so when I make my images, I see different, different aspects of my research, say higher CO2 concentrations. I can manipulate what those look like to help me better understand 
what's actually going on in the atmosphere at that time. So do your codes and, and the data that you process using your codes, does this result in some kind of a visualization? Yes. Can you run like a simulation and then it shows us kind of a picture, some sort of a picture of what the atmosphere looks like? Yes. Yeah, so what I can do is so so you imagine Salt Lake City from a Google Earth perspective or a Google or Google Maps. You can see the two mountain ranges on both sides. So you've got the Wasatch on your to your east and then the Ochres to your west and the Great Salt Lake to the north and the Traverse Mountains to the south. And so I place a grid on that mentally. And at each one of those grid boxes, I have a value for a, CO, a carbon dioxide concentration at every hour of every day for about four years. And so what I can do is I can place a map, a map in, I can write, tell my code, tell my computer program to open up a map. And then on that map, I can say, make CO2 a certain color and CO2 at concentration of 600 parts per million a certain color and have that be a gradient so that then I can watch how it grows and shrinks and how it moves around from say Kennecott over here when you have a lake effect storm and the winds come from the northwest you can watch this, the anthropogenic or the human produced carbon dioxide move all around the valley. Well, that seems very interesting and it also seems really important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, the, some major things that you can use this type of research for is to understand how CO2 can be a tracer for atmospheric pollutants that affect our air quality, especially during the winter. And Jessica, how does coding work in your area of research? Well, coding comes in um, in the work I do both on the um, modeling end and then on the post-processing end, so the making of images for my research. Now what I do is I run a computer model myself, but it's a very different model. Carolyn runs a very small scale model called a box model, and I run what's called a global climate model. So it also solves equations, but for every component you can imagine, that's uh, part of the environment. So um, the sea ice, land, atmosphere, everything has an equation to go with it to measure inputs and outputs of energy at its very base. My focus is on uh, what happens when you either remove ice over the Barents Sea or put more ice in over the Barents Sea and how that affects the atmosphere. Uh, because there's interactions uh, between the exposed ocean or covered ocean and then the atmosphere uh, through fluxes of what we call latent heat, which means hidden heat and also sensible heat. So think of that kind of as heat you could feel, maybe as a change in temperature. Oh, that's really cool. So, <laughs> so and Kimberly, you use coding too? I do, I use very basic coding. I'm just learning. I've been using MATLAB uh, since 2010, and I don't know it very well, but I'm learning it. And right now I'm doing statistical analysis on projected precipitation data along the Wasatch Front. And I'm also running a little bit of statistical analysis on historical precipitation that uh, multiple global climate models um, participate in producing. And with coding now, the, there's different coding languages, right? Like where you mentioned, is MATLAB one of them? Yes. And then there's there's others, right? Like mm -hmm. CSS. And mm -hmm. Python. And, and Fortran. Fortran, <laughs> yes. IDL. <laughs> IDL. It sounds like you're familiar with that <laughs> you use some of these. Yes, all the time. And we're always learning more. So, mm -hmm. uh, How did you get started in coding? Well, mine started, like most things, out of necessity. Um, and this is Jessica. Yes, this is Jessica. <laughs> but um, I started uh, my very first coding uh, in undergrad. There was a class in Fortran, which stands for formula translation. It's a very old computer language. Um, this is the language my dad did <laughs> uh, back in, gosh, way back when we used to use punch cards oh my to gosh. run your yeah. computers and input and output the data. So. Um, but the thing about Fortran is, well, certain types of code lend themselves to certain uses, and Fortran is very good at solving equations. It's basically a glorified calculator. So it comes in handy for things like running global climate models or weather forecasting models, uh, that sort of thing. So it was a good st uh, stepping stone, and I think everybody in my undergrad grad class took it. So yeah, from there, uh, it's also used in the computer model I'm using now a different type of Fortran, but you know, still the same concept. And then in the syntax or way the language is written is very similar to MATLAB. Um, but MATLAB's a lot nicer. It tells you when you have 
you know, an error, or <laughs> and then you can just that run it. <laughs> you don't have to use extra commands to do what's called compiling or basically building the code before you run it. You know, back in the day, my mother was a computer programmer on you know mainframes with punch cards, and and she did she used COBOL. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> I I wasn't sure what that would mean in the world of coding, but I think your oh boy says quite a bit. <laughs> what about you, Kimberly? Um, did, how did you get started with coding? Is MATLAB your first? Yes. So I started doing research in geosciences in my undergrad between my sophomore and junior years. And the professor I was working with had me work with his PhD student who was working with MATLAB. So I basically ran his code. He, writ he wrote all the code and I just hit play and watched it go and sometimes selected things on the images that popped up. Um, but I didn't really start actually writing code until graduate school. I did a little bit my senior year when I was doing my senior thesis work. But it, it's just basically, I think it's just something we need to know. I think it's something really important in our field, knowing how to model and use computer code. And Carolyn, how about you? I also started a little bit as an undergraduate, but I worked with Mathematica to solve equations because I was a physics major, so I didn't actually start to code. Well, I, I tried to take a visual basics class. We've all discussed how important coding is in the geosciences. So in, in our modern world, we have the capability of running quite, quite fast or solving equations really quickly to get an answer to either study sea ice or hydrologic studies in the current past and future. But what's important is also you, that this is an important skill set for us to have because everybody needs, everybody wants to know the answer of what's going on now and what's going to go on in the future. And so whether or not you don't know coding or you do know coding, it's a good way to learn how to think in a different language. Because whether you learn French or Spanish or a different language, it's kind of the same thing as learning a different computer program. Because then you can see how can I answer or solve this problem in a different way and it makes you less intimidated by learning other models. So say you go into the real world and you start studying, you want to study stream flow. Then you can easily pick up a model and look inside and see what's inside. So when I say look inside, that means open up the code and if it's, in, you could probably figure out how to to break into the code and at least see what it looks like so you can understand what the steps that are being taken to solve to solve your earth system, your groundwater system, and the runoff system, and the, the precipitation system. And then you can better understand how that can inform future forecasts for flooding or for, let's say, the sea ice all melts <laughs> and <laughs> what the, what the um, oceans will do and how the climate will process. So it's important in both pure and ac purely an academic sense and also in a practical world aspect. Well, uh, something that's been observed by others regarding language is that there are certain concepts that you can't access in just any language. That there are some concepts that a certain language will have words for, will have kind of as part of the overall culture embedded within them and that there really aren't perfect equivalents in, you know, between a Japanese concept of something and the English language translation. Um, it's that kind of what you're talking about, how like learning different computer languages can help you access different ideas or different ways of analyzing information? Absolutely. That's a fantastic link between language, different types of languages. So say you, you want to write a computer or you want to write a website, that's an HTML. And you wouldn't use MATLAB to write a computer, to write program, or write a code to make a website up. You don't want to do that. You probably could if you really wanted to. <laughs> but, uh, or, code to write the HTML. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly, that's exactly what you did. You, one of our colleagues is writing the code to write a document in MATLAB. So it's just you can write code within codes. And Fortran, you said it was excellent, as Jessica mentioned, is excellent at solving equations, whereas Mathematica is also excellent at solving equations, but you can't really write a, a box model or solve a series of equations in the linear aspect, I guess nonlinear aspect, that you can do that in MATLAB with a lot of efficiency. So this term has come up a couple times, and I, I don't know what it means. A box model? Oh, it's, uh, okay, so this, so this is Carolyn. So what we did was we 
found all the sources and sinks, and then solved it in a mass balance equation. So you account for all the mass that's in the, the model, and it's essentially just a box. And the box is 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, and it grows up with the boundary layer. So that's every morning when it gets sunny, or when the sun comes up, I should say, that heats the air, and the air rises, and you, and that uh, you have mixing throughout that layer, and or throughout that, and that's what we call a box. So a box model is a really simplified what we call computationally efficient way to run a, run a model. Because you're accounting for everything that's there, and it's very fast to run. That's what computationally efficient means. Whereas, Jessica, your model is not a box model, no. and it's not computationally efficient. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, computational efficiency, for what it does, yes, it can be, depending on how you... Uh, set up the modeling program, but it is definitely it's not as fast as say a box model. And I guess a simpler way of looking at a box model is it's you know basically a box where energy goes in or energy goes out. You don't really have the box itself necessarily interacting with um, other features. So. And one more question I have regarding coding, like so Jessica and you learned in a class, mm -hmm. and Kimberly you started to learn it just through the work you were doing and kind of did you have a mentor who gave you pointers along the way or? Yes, I worked with the PhD student who would teach me a little bit about the code he was writing and I would watch him write it and try to pick up on whatever he was writing. And I also had my professor I was working with who was helping a little bit. And then I also ended up taking a MATLAB course which was required for my applied mathematics minor. And I, we worked in partners and had to write our own code for our assignments. And we had about seven assignments. And that was very difficult at times, writing it from scratch. And I was in the office a lot, talking to my instructor. <laughs> he didn't help with that course, so. You know, I have a question on here about any tips you might have for survival skills. And I think you hit on one that I know worked really well for me in my education is you know what, if, you, if you're if you stuck or you don't get it, you just visit that professor. Yes. Use those office hours. Go to office hours. <laughs> and Carolyn, for do you have any tips for people who are interested in getting started learning coding? Well, the first thing is don't be intimidated because intimidation puts up a block and then you won't get anywhere. And the second is turn over your shoulder and ask Jessica for help. Because <laughs> <laughs> we both entered grad school together and have different, our MATLAB skills are more focused on what we do, but it's been a, it's a fantastic resource to have a colleague that helps and other people in the department. And our advisor, you know, when I first entered grad school, I think I spent two to four hours sometimes in his office and we would write code together. And occasionally, we just got an email from him because he was trying to open up a file that I sent him. And he's like, this is a six gigabyte file. I don't want to deal with it. And so he's like, oh, oh, this is, this is a great way to only pull out one variable that you want. And so he'll, he'll send us things that he's just learning in code and we'll share amongst each other. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's awesome. Yes. Well, you just provided the perfect segue to like the next topic that we're hoping to discuss today. <laughs> and that relates to collaboration because, of course, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson are just one of the most durable pairs in all of fiction, right, in all of pop culture. And the way, I mean, Holmes is famous for solving the cases, but at least as portrayed in these films, it's almost always some chance remark or some bumbly little thing that Watson does that brings it together. So I'd like to ask you all about um, collaboration. And, and Kimmy, we were talking before about how terror by night. So that, Carolyn, that's a perfect segue into our next topic. Um, we also had you all watch Sherlock Holmes's Terror by Night and The Woman in Green. And in, in those films, as well as the others that we've discussed already, um, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson are working as a team. Um, Kimmy, is there anything about their collaboration that you think is worth noting? I watched Terror by Night and I kept thinking, this is just like the advisor and the graduate student, or a graduate student and an undergraduate student, because Holmes is the one with like, oh yes, I have all these ideas, and it could be this, and Watson goes out and actually like looks at what's going on and digs into it more and goes back to Holmes and he's like, 
you know, they, they talk about it, but I feel like Dr. Watson does a lot of the more dirty work, I guess, <laughs> in a way. He's the man of action, right? Yes. <laughs> Gets yes. shut down a few times. Yes. <laughs> and keeps, on, keeps on trying. Yeah, exactly. It's just like the advisor and the graduate student, I think. <laughs> Is there anything about their personalities, too, that make them, like, a good team or... Holmes is, is supposed to be like Mr. Rational, right? And Watson's supposed to be like, you know, Mr. Heart, Mr. Man of Impulse and or whatever, maybe intuition. You know, he makes these associations, right? Oh, yes, that reminds me of my piano lesson, you know, <laughs> where they had to number the keys because I was so bad at it, you know? And like, like you know, like, you know, like there's, there's not a lot of concern for dignity in that, right? But like somehow it, it combines. Um, when you're working on a team or you're working, say, you know, you're in the position as, as the Watson on the team working for a professor or working for a graduate student who's supervising you, is there something that that relationship sort of requires to really be productive? I, this is Carolyn. I'll, I'll start a little further back. I think that one thing that I admire in their relationship that's that's highlighted in the films is Sherlock always listens to what Dr. Watson has to say, even if he doesn't always take that advice. And so Dr. Watson always, or um, doc, Dr. Watson will always feel comfortable voicing his opinion, and Sherlock Holmes will sometimes say that's ridiculous. And so in a scene in dressed to kill, Dr. Watson's asking Dr. Holmes, why do you even bother, why are we even bothering to do this? Because somebody broke into the house and stole a music box. That doesn't mean anything. And Dr. Watson, or Sherlock Holmes says, well, just because that's the obvious, it doesn't mean it's the simplest way. It doesn't mean it's correct either. So we must eliminate all other options until we know that this is the one that's true or untrue. And that's a pretty valuable opinion to have as an advisor because your advisor always is able to think larger picture because you gain that with experience. And Dr. Watson is definitely sometimes like a graduate student, always asking lots and lots of questions, sometimes getting down on himself, being like, I know I'm, no, I'm really good at all this stuff, but boy, do I feel like a dummy sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> Especially in the, the one on the um, Terror by Night. Whether it's in the film or not, what are some things regarding working on teams that you've noticed in your own careers? Jessica? I, I guess that one of the other types of benefits is the informal discussions you have uh, with your own group. I mean, uh, we started out with me and Carolyn, and then Kimmy came aboard, and we have some, some of the most interesting discussions just totally off the cuff about each other's research and um, sometimes topics that are, you know, seem unrelated, but we're I say we're really good at bouncing ideas off each other, gaining insight that way because we don't work on the same projects. So that sounds like that's so that sounds like that's a really valuable mm -hmm. um, method too. Absolutely. I mean, you were when we were talking about learning code before, it sounded like you know being able to learn from other people and just even even getting emails like from somebody you collabor mm -hmm. collaborated with in the past, but having that relationship still open so you can continue to learn from each other. Um, that sounds like it's all like would be really valuable for a scientist. Um, I think most people who pay attention to science are aware now that it really is a collaborative field. And I'm going to point out the obvious. You're all women. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and now, as you know, one of the concerns for people who are looking at the big picture as far as science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, Fields is that there seems to be a real disconnect between the number of people who sort of start out interested in these fields and the number of women versus men who go on into STEM careers. And I'm wondering if you have any tips for girls in the sciences or... Um, my, this is Carolyn. My advice, I have a few pieces of advice. The first one is to, to believe in yourself and to stay enthusiastic. The second one is to always surround yourself with people who are smarter than you because if you are constantly intimidated by that other people are smarter than you, then you will eventually, that will eventually be your fate. And so women have to never give up and to always try hard and to seek help from a male or a female mentor. Jessica, do you have any tips? 
Yeah, so I guess kind of building on uh, Carolyn's responses is on uh, a broader picture, surround yourself with a supportive network, whether that's friends or you know family members. Um, the main reason I'm able to do what I do is because my parents are both from a very early age supportive of a kid who wanted to do nothing more than go out and chase tornadoes. I say I start off as a storm junkie and now I, you know, code and look at the Arctic. So I have many interests in the sciences. But whether I was a woman or, you know, whatever I did that was irrelevant to them. They're just like, okay, well, this kid wants to go outside and sit on the play fort when the storms are rolling in. Let's go attach a rain gauge to the fence with a little anemometer, which measures wind speed, you know? You know, they were totally supportive. I went off to... I'll go storm chasing undergrad. Okay, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so what if you aren't lucky enough to have that already in your life? How do you go about cultivating it? This is Carolyn. In my experience teaching in public schools or just being a part of being a scientist in the classroom, there are there are networks out there for women such as Mesa. So my, my advice would be to, to find something that really is exciting to you in your science class something will be super exciting. Find something to be excited about. Take those extra science classes <laughs> just because they sound cool. Yes, and extra math classes. Yes. yes. And go for it. Go well, for and, it. And I think too, like for some people, it is a long, a, it looks like a really long, lonely road. Like if you're not starting out with, you know, that sense of, of a network. But I think if you're following Carolyn and Jessica's advice and Kimberly's advice to just keep going and taking those classes that you do start to build, you meet people who are going yes. to recognize that fire in you if you're not giving up. Then sooner or later, that sense of community is going to show up, and, and that's really pretty cool, and that helps keep you kind of going, too. Absolutely. Yes. A sense of science community is one of the coolest things I've ever felt is... You know, when I have two office mates and friends that we can discuss anything with, go to the museum and talk about code, talk about current events, past events, Sherlock Holmes films. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I wasn't tornado chasing, I was storm chasing to go skiing. But, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you, stick with it. Stick with it, don't be intimidated, and ask for help because there are resources out there for you and that's what the, the world is on your side even if it seems like nothing else is. Mm -hmm. Remember, you're an individual but you're part of a community and science is a large community. Yes, so I was just gonna say even if you don't have it in high school, you can get it in college. You ask a professor, hey, do you have any research? And there you go, it just starts from there and if they don't have Anything they can do, someone else probably does, and they love getting the undergraduates involved in research, and that's a way you can build your network and meet people and just, like, start loving your college experience. Professors love talking about their work. Getting back to Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, um, really quick, do each of you, um, can you tell me what your favorite part was? Well, I have to say, this is Jessica, uh, when, then this, is, this goes back to the secret weapon with the little stick figure codes, and it reminded me so much of the debugging process. When you're trying to go through your code, you do make mistakes when you're programming. You make a lot of them. <laughs> and what you have to do a lot of times is sit down and go through it line by line until something random happens. In this case, um, the one piece of code they couldn't solve until the very end involved turning it around, this one line around, reversing it, and they were able to um, dissect the whole message. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone line by line, can't find it, and then I look at it a little bit differently, or I'm just standing and not thinking about anything, and suddenly I know what's wrong. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I need to insert this, or I need to change the loop this way. So yes, yeah, so the, the aha moment. You know, when you're not really thinking about it, just kind of happen, you know. So you do some Sherlock brain. Holmes analysis, <laughs> and then Watson, yes. the Watson part of your brain yes, sometimes the Watson part gives of you your the brain, answer. The, the brain, you know, when you're relaxed and like, oh! <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with us today, ladies. Thank you Thank so you. much for yes. having us. Yes. I've been talking with Carolyn, Jessica, and Kimberly, all graduate students and atmospheric science at the University of Utah. 
You've been listening to UEN Sci-Fi Friday's Science to Go with the Show. UEN Sci-Fi Friday is a production of the Utah Education Network. Our production and web crew includes Michelle Dumas, Karen Creer, Landon Weeks, Rich Finlinson, and Sherry Wood. The executive producer is Laura Hunter. I'm Jen Gibbs, inviting you to learn more about the classic Sherlock Holmes movies aired on UEN Sci-Fi Friday, the field of atmospheric science, and each of today's guests at the UEN Sci-Fi Friday website online at uen.org slash tv.